Thanks for the intro, Nathan, and thanks for inviting me uh, uh, to the hosts, uh, Xanadu, and really happy to be here. Uh, as you know, very passionate about QML, so very excited about uh, giving a talk today at this event. So yeah, as uh, Nathan mentioned, I'm Guillaume, research scientist, and I kind of lead all things related to QML uh, at uh, Sandbox. So today we'll be talking about research, some of the research we do in our team, and some of the tooling actually for quantum probabilistic generative modeling and beyond, which is uh, ominous, but we'll get to that. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, talks about very large uh, Hilbert spaces and the power of uh, quantum machine learning, uh, embedding in large spaces and so on. But something we got to remember is that uh, quantum theory is actually, uh, you know, an extension of uh, probability theory, right? And probability distributions themselves are you know objects that live in also an exponentially uh, large space, and so I, I guess so the research I'll be featuring today uh, is at the intersection between you know probability theory and quantum theory, or rather probabilistic machine learning and quantum machine learning. We'll get to that in a second. So what do I mean by you know probabilistic? Uh, information or you can have bits right they're deterministic zero or one uh, uh, you could also have uh, probabilistic bits which are mixtures of zero and one right they each uh, sum they're positive real numbers and they sum up to one and in quantum uh, for pure states we have uh, wave functions and the complex values sum up to one right and the interesting thing happens when you have several uh, probabilistic bits or several uh, qubits. So for several probabilistic bits, actually the, the distribution in general lives uh, in, a, in a vector space that's two to the n dimensional over positive reals. And for a wave function, it's over the complex values. So it's actually not that uh, it takes uh, exponentially many parameters to, uh, to describe a general uh, distribution that, in, in, that is quantum that gives it its power over say classical probabilistic machine learning, right? So we gotta actually dig deeper and get to the bottom of what are quantum computers good for and how do we leverage that, right? You know, we've all seen and heard of the power of, you know, deep uh, or, or semi-deep or shallow-ish uh, quantum circuits that are very dense, packed with a lot of gates. Uh, they could be random rotations and so on. The, Quantum complexity, right, or the complexity rather of classical simulation uh, of these circuits, you know, scales very rapidly, right? And why is that? You know, f fundamentally, it's because uh, sampling from it is kind of like integrating a path integral that is, you know, at each layer, it's complex valued summations. And you have all sorts of interferences across all these, these possibilities, right? You could think of it as kind of a exponentially large multi-slit experiment. And uh, that, that, that becomes really hard, right? So fundamentally, at least what was demonstrated in terms of a separation between quantum and classical computing was, right, quantum supremacy, which is sampling from deep unitaries. It's very difficult to do so with classical computers. So the idea is, okay, how do we leverage, incorporate, you know, shallow-ish unitaries into classical probabilistic machine learning to kind of extend its reach and make it more powerful rather than try to replace it, um, which actually some of my earlier research before I joined Alph Alphabet was focused on. So as I mentioned, classical uh, quantum computer is becoming powerful enough to be uh, unsimulatable, and we want to leverage this power synergistically with deep learning. So the solution, at least uh, in, in our approach, is to both innovate in creating hybrid models and ways to train them and uh, software for these hybrid models, right? Um, so you have hybrid quantum classical models and hybrid quantum class classical software. You've all heard of uh, hybrid models uh, during this event, which is, uh, you know, exceptional. Usually at most conferences, there's not as many QML uh, focused speakers. So it's, it's wonderful. I don't have to introduce all these concepts from scratch. Um, but the idea of hybrid uh, models is really to break up the task of learning a representation of the data or isolating a hidden parameter of the data, uh, you know, break it up between classical components of a representation and quantum components. This is in contrast to just 
variational algorithms, which are also called quantum classical algorithms, where the optimizer is classical, but the model itself is all quantum, right? So I'm going to start with the models and we'll get to the software in a second. So you've all seen this comparison by now. Uh, I think a lot of people made this uh, comparison now. Uh, you know, you have classical feed for neural networks, they have parameters, you can have some inputs, and then you have a parameterized function. And you like to tune, uh, you know, f, f of uh, the parameterized function f of x, depending on phi, uh, you, want, you want to tune phi such as to fit some, some loss function, right, uh, to optimize, some loss functional to optimize, uh, you know, minimize the distance between uh, your data and the output of the neural net. And for quantum neural networks, usually it's pure states, right? So you have a parameterized, you have a fixed input, let's say, and then you have a parameterized output that's conditioned on the parameters of the QNN, and then you train it, again, according to some uh, loss functional. A functional is something that takes your big vector uh, or your function and then converts it to a scalar, a single scalar. So how do we hybridize quantum classical deep learning? Uh, you know, there's kind of two main pillars. I mean, this is kind of old school, but now it's becoming more and more uh, blurry the lines between these two, but uh, you know, traditionally there's generative models and there's discriminative models, right? Generative models they have a data set, and you have some samples from this data set from the true probability distribution, and you want to variationally tune a probability distribution or a model that you could sample that uh, such that the probability distribution of the model approximates the underlying true distribution, right? And you do that by kind of minimizing some form of statistical distance over the points you know and you've sampled, right? And for discriminative models, it's very much like generative models. It's just that you actually have pairs of you know, inputs and outputs. So it's more about learning conditional distributions, right? And you know, usually how you do that is you, you have a parameterized function, and then you say your distribution is either a delta function or a Gaussian, whose mean is like the, the output of the parameterized function. And you could train it uh, with you know, KL divergence or, or mean square loss and so on. Okay. So how 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 do you have then generative and discriminative hybrid models? So I guess what we'll focus on today is uh, generative hybrid models, right? Uh, in our case, it's uh, you have a probability distribution. It's parameterized. Say uh, our favorite is uh, energy-based models, which are uh, Boltzmann distributions where the energy function is parameterized by a neural network, and that parameterizes a distribution. That model is sampled. You could sample bit strings, and then depending on the bit strings, you flip, you flip the input, right? And uh, we'll we'll have more details of the math behind this. But at that point, you've inserted uh, a classical probability distribution into your quantum computer on average, right? Um, after that, you append a QNN, and you get a resulting output that's actually a mixed state. Um, that's what we'll talk about today. Uh, you might have seen talks about hybrid, uh, discriminative uh, quantum classical neural networks. Usually it means that you add uh, classical post-processing to uh, a quantum uh, neural network, right? So that you can further extract uh, hidden information, hidden in the data. Um, so let's focus on the generative models. So, you know, most, most data in nature is actually sitting at the intersection of probability theory and, and quantum theory, right? Um, most states in nature are not pure states. They're actually mixed states because you're either looking at a subsystem or effectively an open uh, quantum uh, system, right? Um, you know, the point of it in, in quantum computers is to create artificially closed uh, quantum systems. So we have full unitary control over them. Um, but uh, the idea is that a mixed state is a probability distribution over pure states, right? There's a few ways to represent it. You could, you could uh, phrase it as, as a mixture of different mixed state or as a mixture of orthogonal and perfectly distinguishable uh, uh, pure states, right? And that's the eigen decomposition of the uh, mixed state, which is the diagonal form. Um, so how do we represent these mixed states? Well, just from describing them, I've kind of uh, given you a spoiler that really what you'll wanna do is compose a model that can learn uh, distributions with a model that can learn uh, changes of bases, right? Um, unitaries that create uh, wave functions. So I guess uh, what our team is, has been really bullish on has been quantum probabilistic hybrid deep learning. And as mentioned in the intro, usually you have a parameterized pure state uh, and you, you train it, you know, say for VQE uh, to minimize some expectation value. 
Instead, what we have is, again, a parameterization of a classical distribution. And then we plug that in, you know, depending on the samples, we, we do some bit flips. At the output here, the effective state is like a diagonal uh, mixed state. Uh, and then after that, you append a unitary. And the fact that it's unitary comes in handy uh, for all sorts of calculations and, and trainability. Um, and, uh, you know, effectively, you have a classical latent representation, and then you plug it through a unitary, and then you get a parameterized mixed state instead of parameterized pure state. Um, and the, this form uh, is, is, is trainable for all sorts of tasks. Uh, so you could do all sorts of great stuff. And uh, the, the two first applications uh, we looked at, which were, we thought were pretty fundamental, were kind of two dual tasks. Um, I'm gonna spend some time on this slide here. Um, the first is variational quantum thermalization. So let's say I wanna model, you know, what are, what are interesting mixed states in nature? Thermal states, right? Everything that reaches equilibrium, you just leave it somewhere. Um, it, it converges to something called a thermal state, which is a Boltzmann uh, distribution. And the, you could create a variational principle for both the classical model and the quantum model, right, together, uh, such that the hybrid model, uh, right, has, a, has a, high, a variational principle for both types of parameters, such that uh, minimizing a certain functional, in this case, quantum free energy, you know, you converge, if, if you find the absolute minimum over all parameterizations of quantum free energy, you've found the thermal state, right? And, you know, the trick is like, okay, it's great. You could phrase a theoretical loss function, but can you sample it? Can you evaluate it? Can you get its gradients? Uh, and the answer is yes. And actually, if you use what we uh, mentioned before, energy-based models, uh, you, you get some very nice parameter shift rules, not only for the quantum component, uh, which is unitary, which we know you could use penny lane or tensor flow quantum, uh, but also for the classical component, there's kind of a parameter shift there because it's an exponential form. So if you're interested in that, you know, I won't get into the details today, uh, but check out the TensorFlow Quantum White Paper or some of the papers I'll be uh, linking, linking to in a few slides. Right. So we can create thermal states with these generative models. This is kind of the generative pipeline, right, to evaluate the loss that is a free energy, which is the difference between energy and entropy. Um, what's cool is that the entropy doesn't depend on uh, the quantum computer. Uh, so kind of simplifies the pipeline there. Um, quantum Hamilton, modular Hamiltonian learning is like the dual task. You're trying to have a model that looks like this, a pipeline that looks like this, that replicates the distribution of a given data state. Suppose you're given copies of sigma D, some unknown mixed state, right? It's, it's, it's kind of like being given samples of an unknown distribution for generative modeling, as we saw in the intro. Um, let's say I want to learn to generatively model the distribution, right? Replicate it, this, this mixed state. Then what I can do is actually minimize quantum cross entropy. Uh, and you could evaluate it directly and its gradients uh, using a pipeline like this. You use actually the reversibility of unitary evolutions. So you take your data, you plug it in reverse, and then you could evaluate, uh, this is kind of the expectation value of, uh, you know, the unnormalized log likelihood, once you've gotten your classical samples, right, it becomes classical data, right? Um, again, details in the papers, but the point is that you parameterize your hypothesis class over mixed states as a thermal state over a learnable Hamiltonian, right? And you train that uh, hybrid system. And that Hamiltonian, again, is also parameterized as um, a unitary and a classical neural network. Um, and so you learn an effective, it's called a modular Hamiltonian, a log, a normalized log operator for your data. And uh, there again, parameter shift gradients. And if you tune into the March meetings, uh, we're actually gonna show how you can get exact uh, parameter shifts for the natural gradients or the quantum Fisher information metric for these types of model. Um, so great. Uh, I don't want to get too deep into the math. I think uh, there's a, a, a wide dynamic range of expertise in the room. Uh, but what can you do with this, right? Can I simulate a superconductor? Sure, right? Uh, we're, we're looking for, you know, a holy grail of using quantum computers just to figure out new superconductors. You could, you could train, uh, you know, a, a, a VQT model to uh, discover new superconductors. It converges in 100 uh, iterations of gradient descent. 
Uh, can you learn, you know, a general spin, spin glass or whatever density matrix given just access to the data without knowing uh, the Hamiltonian? And the answer is yes, you can, you can reconstruct uh, afterwards. Um, something we we're interested in was how much actual quantum circuit we need. So depending on the temperature of quantum systems, you could sweep the temperature and the actual complexity, the quantum complexity of the, the quantum state, that's the thermal state, will vary depending on the temperature and all sorts of parameters, right? And the idea was to sweep over how deep of a QNN do we need to get an accurate representation. So those are some results uh, coming in the V2 of the VQT uh, paper. But it gets to the point of maybe I don't, maybe for high temperature systems, actually, you don't need that much quantum depth, right? Maybe you just need a little bit of quantum depth added to classical ML and, and you get some, some advantage there. So that's what we're trying to hone in on. What's the earliest win, right? Instead of trying to load, overload the quantum computer. So this is a hackathon. So code first, right? Uh, I'm, I'm leaving these QR codes here. You can scan them. There's a TensorFlow Quantum implementation of VQT and QMHL. Uh, there's also Penny Lane, a very nice blog post. Uh, thanks to Jackson O'Roney and the Xanadu team. Great. Um, so software, uh, last uh, second bit. Uh, so uh, something I worked on very heavily was uh, TensorFlow Quantum. Uh, and you know it's to integrate you know, state-of-the-art uh, ML framework uh, deeply uh, integrated with quantum computing. Um, you know it's a deep hybridization of TensorFlow and CERC, as opposed to like Penny Lane, which is more like uh, you know an all-terrain vehicle. TensorFlow Quantum is kind of like a, a drag racer. <laughs> it's made for like one track, and you use CERC with TF, uh, and uh, it goes fast, right? And that was kind of a, a different design decision. It has its pluses and minuses, and uh, you know you're encouraged to try both. Uh, and and, and uh, yeah, so you know similar to frameworks that are out there now, uh, you know you can have expectation values taken care of, gradient calculations. It parallelizes across many cores. Um, I would I would suggest using large CPU uh, instances for TFQ usually. Uh, it's great for any variational algorithm workflows, but of course the focus is on hybrid quantum classical deep learning uh, and, and quantum data, actually. Uh, so quantum data is you know, quantum mechanical data uh, rather than embedding classical data into the quantum uh, a computer. I guess our opinionated take is that we should try to focus on growing the market of quantum data problems. And we're trying to encourage that. Uh, of course, it does hybrid backprop where you could backprop get gradients through uh, a quantum circuit if you have kind of a, sandwich in time of a deep neural network or differentiable function before and after. Uh, you can get a backpropagated effective Hamiltonian, takes gradients of that, and then basically you've backpropagated through the whole thing. It's finite difference, parameter shift, stochastic parameter shift rules. You've heard about these this week. I'm blasting through these, but, uh, and recently there's uh, a joint differentiation, which really speeds up the research. That's when you can uh, but the, of course, that's that's illegal on the quantum computer. But when you're just doing research on classical computers, a joint differentiation, highly recommend it. Um, you know, it, it's deeply integrated with TF. Uh, our workflow, we use uh, TF probability and TensorBoard. Uh, and you can visualize, you know, all the weights and, and the training and diagnose what's going on in your QNN. So I, if, you're, if you're wondering about how to do that workflow, we have some blog posts hopefully coming soon. And you can you can reach out. Um, so make sure to check out tensorflow.org slash quantum. Uh, the two links are the white paper and the VQT uh, QMHL paper. Be sure to uh, check them out. Cool. So we have some questions. Um, keep, keep them coming, please, in, in the chat. But some questions are also about your background. So you have quite a, you know, a, a nice history where you were a researcher in, in grad school and you find your way now to Sandbox and you're now you know, featured speaker on QHack, which is obviously a top billing here. <laughs> so how, what is your particular background and do you have any recommendations for people who are just starting out? How do they get prepared? I think there's not like one standard path and, and what's been eye-opening for me has been having friends that um, reach a similar point to where I am in my career, uh, sometimes even faster. Uh, so I guess what I could say is, you know, for example, on the TensorFlow Quantum team, 
um, you know, I, I was a theoretical physicist, I think in 2016, 2017, um, did a master's in theoretical physics, was doing quantum field theory. I cast a very wide net. Like I, I took every grad course I could find that had the word quantum in it. I think I, I count like 15 or something ridiculous. Uh, so I've, to me, like, it's like having varied training data and then you, you transfer learn better. So that's been my background as kind of a theory focused person, but for, you know, uh, coders and hackers, uh, I've had folks that came from CS background out of undergrad, from mechanical engineering out of undergrad. And actually we just became friends, started hanging out, started hacking some QML together. We wrote a couple papers together. We ended up launching a product called TensorFlow Quantum uh, from, from those experiments. Um, and now uh, those people uh, right out of undergrad are employed full time uh, at various parts of Google in, in quantum computing, in the quantum computing industry. So, so really there's, there's no standard path that depends what you want. If you want to be a theorist that kind of generalizes from the state of the art of theory, then the wider net you could cast and the later specialization you could do, the better, in my opinion. If you just want to get going, there's actually nothing stopping you. Um, you know, it's, it's still an early field, so don't let any gatekeepers or anybody say you don't have this that background stop you from from uh, you know trying to do some damage to the literature in, in a good way. Uh, so uh, so yeah, I've I've seen a, a high dynamic range of like in terms of background uh, of people that have been very successful in the quantum space. Can 100 percent back that up, Yom. I think one of the things I like the best about your work is when I when I see your papers, I can I can actually I can tell that you're reading the deep learning papers properly. You're not just someone who's taken a Wikipedia page on neural networks and stopped there. Like, you know what the latest ideas are from deep learning and you're able to cross pollinate between you know, quantum and, and the other field. So I, I think that's a great advice for anyone out there is it's really tough actually to be a, a world expert in one field. Uh, and speaking also personally, it's a lot easier to be good or really good at multiple fields and see those connections. And actually you can do much better in the end by seeing those connections rather than being too narrow and focused. So that's that's really great advice, Gil. Absolutely. I do want to I do want to call you out though because you skipped over some of the most interesting parts of the story. So I'm going to flesh it out a little bit more here sure. uh, for the benefit of our audience. So let's go back to, to day one. We had um, Patrick Coles speaking yesterday and he was mentioning mm -hmm. his his tipping point for getting into QML was actually a chance encounter with you in, in a lobby of a, a building or a lunchroom or something like that. Right, 2015. I think um, I was still had to write my thesis for my master's, which was in, in quantum field theory, and uh, I was trying to solve quantum gravity or something, <laughs> as 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 theorists do. Um, and uh, you know, I I was kind of getting uh, you know, I think theoretical physics is an, an interesting place, but it's kind of hovering around the same concepts for a little bit. And there was this thing on the horizon, and I was sitting at IQC. Uh, you know, called quantum computing. And back then it was sci-fi, you know, there weren't really that much uh, startups and, and opportunities. Uh, and Patrick uh, and I just, you know, the IQC water cooler, which is, you know, one of the water coolers I've learned the most uh, from uh, in my life. Uh, we just, you know, struck up a conversation, talked about this new field, quantum machine learning. What is that? You know, in 2015, there was Seth Lloyd, Patrick Rebentrost, you know, uh, Museni and so on. There was th those early papers um, just showing that there's maybe something interesting here. And we needed to learn more about that. So we, we had a, you know, year long uh, journal club that we organized and we just read a bunch of papers and then we realized, wow, there's still a lot of opportunities left in this field. Actually, even though it's riskier, I think I'm going to go all in on this field. Right. And I told my supervisor, I'm not doing theoretical physics for my PhD. I'm doing quantum machine learning. He told me, I can't help you, but I'll support you. Right. Um, and yeah, turns out that was that was a bet uh, worth doing. Right. Uh, Steven Weinberg, uh, you know, Nobel laureate in physics said, go to the fields that are like a mess and not figured out yet. Right. Because because when when they're clean and, and you know exactly what increments to add to it, it's almost it's like too late. Um, and so, yeah, take risks and, you know, don't, don't let, you know, uh, the illusion of there being a wall of established expertise, you won't be able to pierce through, uh, dissuade you from like going into a field. Yeah. Awesome. I, I definitely recommend to anyone out there who's listening now, it's, it's great advice you're getting from Guillaume here. 
So how did it feel for you when you, you kind of flipped that switch? So you you were looking for something, you found it, and you, you went from reading papers to at some point writing papers and contributing to the field. How did how did that change happen? <laughs> um yeah, that's 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 interesting. I think actually I uh I was just talking in the Toronto Waterloo Tech Corridor, uh, I think having some beers at uh, U Waterloo Pub. And there was some some people from the Creative Destruction Lab, I think, uh, which is the origin or one of the accelerators of Xanadu. They were around and they were starting this QML accelerator. And uh, yeah, we just had a conversation and they were like, do you want to come give some lectures on quantum algorithms? It's like, sure, I guess I could come give some lectures. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, I prepared the lectures uh, the night before uh, during a crazy all-nighter. And I just read a bunch of papers, prepared a bunch of lectures. And then suddenly I felt like I knew quantum algorithms, or you know, enough to explain them. And then suddenly I was there, you know, I was 24 at the time. And there were a bunch of founders trying to start quantum companies. And there uh, I, I met Tom uh, and uh, Will Zhang and uh, Will Zhang, uh, who's now at Unitary Fund. And Will Zhang uh, was like, that was, you know, that was a cool lecture. Why don't you jump into one of these companies, you know, uh, just try it out. And so at the time, uh, yeah, we co-founded something with Tom and, and Michael, who went, who's now the, the lead of TensorFlow Quantum. And we were, uh, yeah, we were a player in the quantum space. And uh, yeah, that's, that's how it started for me is like just seeing that there's no barriers. So I started with industry and then because we were a startup, we wanted to show that we know our stuff. And I think Mike just sat on this chair right here, uh, I think three years ago, and we just hacked one of the early Q&N papers just because, uh, just for fun over a weekend. Uh, it, it was put together very quickly. Uh, and then we put it in an archive and uh, the rest is history. And then it was just, you know, a runaway effect beyond that. But uh yeah, just it starts with just having fun hacking away with your friends, even if you don't know what you're doing. And then if you just keep compounding on that, uh, you get to you get to the top levels. Nothing's stopping you. So, yeah, I remember I remember those days. I, uh, Xanadu was one of the partner companies at Creative Destruction Lab because we had previously gone through the machine learning program because there was no quantum program at that time. So you guys right. went through it the first year. It was a quantum it's now called a quantum program, but it's a quantum machine learning dedicated program back then. And I remember all you guys back then. It was really cool because you told me, I'm actually here to just, just give a lecture. And then suddenly you were, you know, roped into founding a startup company. What was the name of your company, by the way? It was Everettian, uh, you know, like the Everettian interpretation of quantum mechanics. And uh, I guess at the time I was thinking of, you know, everybody was wondering, how do you train quantum neural networks using a quantum computer? And I was really, I had just given a lecture on quantum optimization, QOA. And uh, I was just already dreaming of like, actually, we're going to use superpositions over the parameters and quantum dynamics to optimize quantum neural networks. And that's what we were thinking. And hence the name of the company, because you use the multiverse in a sense to, you know, optimize over, over quantum neural networks. Um, you know, ultimately, I think uh, our, our algorithm was a bit more sci-fi uh, than we wanted. Uh, we ended up, uh, you know, Michael and I uh, jumping to Google and putting out like a 80 plus page paper, which was just, yeah, it, it, was, it was like a pressure valve of ideas. I just have to un unload them and put them out there. But that paper is still out there and it, it's still valid. It, it's just, uh, it's going to take more qubits to store. So, so instead of just having variation algorithms where the parameters are on the classical computer and the models on the quantum computer, it's like everything was on the quantum computer. And the gradient descent itself is on the quantum computer. And then after that, actually, we we uh, collaborated right on this continuous variable QOA, which was adapting that algorithm for analog uh, photonic uh, quantum computers. So uh, yeah, that was that was a fun path there. Yeah, you know? it's, a, it's a really really cool paper. Really. Um... Far-reaching thinking, I was thinking. Like it's it's really like seeing a lot of things connect to them, even if the devices aren't available today. Like the ideas in that paper are really solid. If anyone has the the Patience. constitution to get through 83 pages, <laughs> I recommend checking it out. Right. 
So Guillaume, you told you mentioned Michael. Um, so tell tell me about the creation of TFQ. Like you had the startup. How did that evolve? How did how did TFQ emerge from that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think um, you know we we ended up um, you know uh, leaving the startup and just writing a paper. And I think uh, you know we were joking. Uh, we're we're going to finish three weeks in advance before the conference at NASA, and then. Three weeks later, we're like, oh, we're probably going to finish before the plane ride. And then in the plane, it's like, oh, God, I hope we finish the paper before the talk, which is in a few days. And yeah, I mean, we just put out the paper that week and we gave a talk at NASA. And at that point, uh, Hartman was there, which uh, was the lead, the head of he is the head of uh, Google AI Quantum. And I just did the good old fashioned thing of uh, walking up to the lead, uh, shaking his hand and introducing myself. And uh you know, then he invited us to give a talk uh, in Venice, and then discussion started from there. Uh, you know, Michael, uh, Michael came down as well, and uh, you know, we were just some ambitious kids, and uh, you know, they were like, "Well, if you can make a quick prototype, um, you know, we'll consider you guys to, you know, as uh, you know, potentially the guys to build TensorFlow Quantum," and uh, you know. Uh, when opportunity knocks, you uh, kick down that door and smile, uh, says Dwayne The Rock Johnson, right? So we just uh, flew home and then we uh, hacked away for like two weeks. And uh, yeah, and then we sent a prototype and, you know, it was, it was very early prototype uh, back then. Uh, Cirque wasn't out, so we were starting from scratch. But uh, yeah, that was enough to get us attention. And, you know, we did several internships on a rotation we recruited some of our friends. We did kind of an after-school kind of skunk works project at IQC to develop the uh, library and open source. Uh, you know, it was a it was a two pizza team. You know, I just order the pizzas uh, on the weekends and nights, and we just hack away on top of our regular grad school. Uh, and now we're all working uh, in, in quantum industry. So uh, it's crazy how fast things go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's it's really amazing how how you know tides can turn like that. If you got the one idea in the right place at the right time, you talk to the the right person, how it can really you know open these opportunities that weren't weren't clear before. Right, right. So in terms of opportunities, we're getting more questions about uh, advice. People who want to make a transition, they're in another field. They're in, for instance, high energy physics. You know, high level. What would you advise them if they do want to switch to something like QML or any field really? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. I guess I honestly I don't want to be personally pinned down to any one field ever, right? I I think I'm I'm a generalist, and it's it's kind of like it, it's a way of life. <laughs> like it's not an end, end state. It's like you're always learning new fields. So even myself, I'm trying to push myself on like the ML side and you know other fields. Um, you know, learning about neuromorphics and stuff like that recently. Um, so it's, it's just, it's not a, it's not an end point. It's, it's like an ever ending journey of, you just want to assimilate as much, be curiosity driven and try to integrate that into a very compressed model of things in your head. Right. You know, really make sure to be able to give the TLDR to I'm going to read for most of the papers you read and just get used to ingesting a lot of papers and just like zigzagging through it and being able to get the gist of it. You know, it's got to be good enough so somebody gets it, but maybe downsampled enough so that the authors might be a bit offended if you summarized it so simply, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think Einstein built that skill at the patent office, right? And I, I read that and I was like, okay, I got to get better at just like getting through a lot of content and filtering and, and kind of getting to a, a latent representation that's simplified, right? And you, in that case, you want the most varied data set you know, so that you could generalize. So yeah, high intake, just intake a lot, read everything. Doesn't matter if it's not technically your field yet, you might make connections later. Yeah. Great advice. I hope the, the people in the chat really appreciate hearing that from you. All right, let's let's, uh, let's turn a little corner here. We're getting a few questions that are a bit more uh, fun in, in nature. So one oh. question from, from uh, actually someone on our team looks like, have you ever played d and It seems to be a theme right now at, uh, like you have just a few people are coming out as D&D players. No, I've never played D&D. &D. All my physics friends were playing D&D &D 
and I would just go for the bonus question, the quantum field theory assignment in undergrad. So that was, <laughs> that was my thing, but I do, um, yeah, I mean, recently I play a lot of uh, video games of all sorts uh, on on the custom PC and all that. That's been a big hobby of mine during during the, these times that we're indoors. Um, is, it, is it PC running TPUs? Uh, no, but it's it's running it's running the best hardware you can get today. So it's the cutting edge AMD and NVIDIA stuff. Uh, that's I'm afraid to ask how much uh, he sunk into that bad boy. Oh, it was, it was, I'll just tell you, it was an eBay purchase, not an, an Amazon or, or direct purchase. So that's how you got to get these parts. But, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting times. I think everybody wants to game or mine things. So very high demand for, for computing, which, you know, it's good. Ultimately, you know, the more demand there is, um, you know, the more computing technology is ubiquitous, the cheaper it is, and then the cheaper deep learning or, or uh, you know, quantum simulations on classical hardware are, right? And uh, eventually, I guess that's what we want with, with quantum computing as well. We want, like, varied applications, right, that, like, just, you know, if there's a lot of applications of quantum computing, right, that's going to give it a lot of customers, and there's going to be a bigger market for quantum computing, quantum hardware, and then quantum electronics prices are going to go down. And so actually that's, that's one of the reasons I went into QML. It was in theoretical physics. Uh, uh, I thought that the future of theoretical physics was actually through quantum computing to, to do quantum gravity. And there's all sorts of research in that space. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, how do I help quantum computing? Well, we need, we need better applications. We need to widen the markets or invent new markets. And so ML and quantum seem to be a high potential connection. So focused in on that. But, you know, it, it might be QML, but, you know, it might be quantum security or, I don't know, quantum hash functions, heck, uh, quantum blockchain someday. I don't know. I don't want to put it out there, but I haven't read any research on quantum blockchain. I just, you know, uh, you never know, right, uh, what's going to drive demand for quantum computing. So I think people should keep an open mind uh, at this point. Um, it's okay to be opinionated. Uh, you know, like I, I have all sorts of opinions on Twitter about, you know, my bets of where I think advantages are going to be. Like ultimately, like I have an open mind that, you know, I will be wrong on some instances and people should be free to explore like all sorts of crazy applications of, of quantum computing. Right. So. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that there's any any end in sight to the world's hunger for more and more compute. It's just going to keep growing. That's right. Yeah, we got one more question in the chat here. Um, this is from someone, you know, it's my colleague Juan Miguel. He's asking. What's your opinion on publishing papers? And I think I think there's he's throwing throwing some shade your way because you mentioned <laughs> a paper earlier that we had collaborated on and it never actually got published because we, you know, never yeah. got past submission stage. I think. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I don't know. I I, I think um, you don't have to answer it, that. That's just a, no, no, it's some shade. No, but I'll, I'll say something. I think that um, switching from academia to industry, I think academia there's kind of this 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 rat race for H index or like overfitting to metrics, right? And I guess to me, the important thing was having impact, putting ideas out there and building great product and making it convenient for people to do quantum computing. And that's always my priority above all else, I guess, over like my boosting my own uh, metrics. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I may return back to some some old submissions and, and fix them up, but uh, hey, there you go, Juan Miguel. He's uh, he's back in. All right, good, good. All right, one more one more kind of fun thing to finish off here, Guillaume. So I saw um, there was lots of activity on Twitter earlier in the the winter about QHack. People were submitting memes and so forth. Just quickly, we have also um, I noticed there was one tweet where where someone said that you should form a quantum band. So I want I want to kind of riff on that a little bit. Okay. So you're going to form a quantum computing band. What is what is the name of your quantum computing band? Oh, uh, definitely Qubit Wave. That's that's uh, you know it's like synth wave, but like with qubits. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I'm I, I don't really play instruments. I think I did as as a kid various things, but not really too seriously. So I would I don't have to singer? go. Sorry, you're going to be the lead singer. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'd be happy to to create some some synthetic uh, quantum quantum noise uh, with some quantum programming, and then we can use that as music. Nice. Yeah. So who, who else uh, out of the QHack speakers or, or even others in the field 
Who's in your band? <laughs> I mean, I think Will Zeng and I uh, agreed that uh, we're, we'd probably join forces. But beyond that, I don't know. I'm open-minded. Too bad show. <laughs> Uh, it could start like that, and then we could we could grow the band. Who knows? After we go on tour, sell a couple albums, you know, who who knows? Awesome. And uh, what is the what is the title of your breakout album for Creep It Wave? <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> uh, mm, that's a good that's a good question. I don't know. I think I, I do a nod to my old startup and um, Everettian Vibrations or something like that. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Final question here. Um, what is your band's famous hit signal? Say it's hit single. And if you can use the word Feynman in it somewhere, because I see him on the wall there and some people were shouting out that they saw him. Oh, Feynman? My our hit sig signal. Uh, uh, sig single. Uh, yeah, Feynman signals. There you go. <laughs> Fine. All right. So watch, watch for that coming uh, fall 2021. 2021. Keep it wave. It's going to be a new breakout act in the quantum computing space. Absolutely. <laughs> Yom, thanks very much for joining us. It's been really fun. I, I'm sure that people in the chat really enjoyed hearing from you today. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me.